Hey, good morning, church. Good to see you guys this morning. Uh, as Pastor Neil said, we'll be in Nehemiah chapter 7, so if you're not already there, I invite you to turn there in your Bibles. And it's my great privilege this morning to bring us back into our verse-by-verse -verse study through the book of Nehemiah and to expand on this theme that we've had since the beginning of the book, Jesus Rebuilds and Restores. Now, it's kind of a unique Sunday. We've been away from Nehemiah for a couple of weeks now. And so I think we all need a little refresher from that. It's also a natural transition, as Neil was saying, in the book. There are two parts to the book. And so we're in that natural transition area. So what I'd like to do is just begin with a brief recap of where we've been in Nehemiah. Some brief observations, if I may, from chapters 1 through 6 to kind of get us on track together. Can I do that? Is that okay with you guys? Good. So Nehemiah chapter 1. It begins with news from Jerusalem. Now, how many of you were here when we started this book? Nehemiah chapter 1. Good. You're uniquely equipped to answer the question. Was the news that came good news or bad news? It was bad news. Man, it was terrible news. It sets you back there. It's, uh, it's kind of the worst of the worst. Here's the picture from verse 3 in Nehemiah chapter 1. The survivors, it says there, who were left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. Great distress and reproach. Broken down. Burned with fire. Doesn't sound like good news to me. See, Jerusalem, known as the city of peace, was in shambles. And here's Nehemiah's response to that. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. It was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. That's chapter 1. Chapter 2, and we'll move through these quickly. Nehemiah, who was the Persian king's cupbearer, steps way above his pay grade and asks if he can go and rebuild the city of Jerusalem. But that's not all he asked for. He also asked for letters from the king to ensure safe passage. Then he asked for the resources needed to rebuild the city. The king even sent captains of the army and horsemen with Nehemiah to protect him as he went. And you've almost got to ask the question, why would the king do all these things for a mere servant? Well, Nehemiah explained it like this, and the king granted them to me according to the good hand of my God upon me. See, God had shown tremendous favor to Nehemiah. However, this favor had deeply disturbed two men that would oppose Nehemiah throughout the length of the project. You probably remember these guys, Sanballat and Tobiah. Sanballat and Tobiah. Chapter 3. Chapter 3 is all about people, and it gives a detailed account of all those who began the work on the city's wall. Nehemiah, with his amazing leadership skills, is remembered as the person who rebuilt the wall. Talk about the wall of Jerusalem, you're going to connect the name Nehemiah with it. But there are many people, both named and unnamed, who did the work. In total, 38 names are mentioned and 42 groups. And that got the wall building underway. In chapter 4, the wall was completed to half its height all around the city. And the opposition, led by who? Sanballat and Tobiah. Good. First service just went dead on me when I asked that. You guys are great. The opposition was outraged. The, the city wall is completed all around the city to half its height. 
That's a, a very big deal. Things got so sketchy at this point that the workers were trained to give one hand to the work on the wall and the other to hold the weapon. It was a scary time, yet progress continued under the threat of attack. But what the enemy couldn't do in chapter 4, the Jews kind of did to themselves in chapter 5. See, Sanballat and Tobiah could not stop the work of God on the wall. But the work was stopped when God's people turned against each other. This is an interesting chapter that relates how Nehemiah dealt with an economic crisis that threatened the unity of God's people right in the middle of building the wall. It was the haves and the have-nots. The leaders and nobles of Jerusalem were ruthless in their abuse of the people. The people were in debt. and They couldn't purchase food. They couldn't pay their taxes. Some were forced to mortgage their property. And others actually had to sell their children into slavery for the money. It was a very dark time in the city's history. But listen, Nehemiah's response to the crisis was a speedy and effective reprimand. On his own authority, he asked those holding pledges to release them and to forgive debts. It's like taking money out of their pocket. And by the power of God, the lenders repented and released their holdings. Wow. Now, chapter 5 closes with a sketch of Nehemiah's own financial sacrifice. Though entitled to live off the food allowance for the governor, Nehemiah was a role model to the people, and he refused this compensation. Then in chapter 6, we see a last-ditch effort by Sanballat and his crew to take down Nehemiah before the doors and the gates of the city were hung. Now, this is where it gets really personal to Nehemiah. There were multiple invites to lure Nehemiah to the plains of Ono simply to harm him. Sanballat accused Nehemiah of subversion and a plan to make himself king. He said, man, that's what, that's what Nehemiah is doing. He's trying to make himself king. A secret informer encouraged Nehemiah to flee to the temple for safety. And then there were these interesting relationships between the Jewish nobles and Tobiah. But in spite of all this resistance, the wall was finished. And so that's a quick summary of chapters 1 through 6. That's Nehemiah's own account of rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem. And now jumping into chapter 7, we find ourselves at a transition between the two main sections of the book of Nehemiah. It's a transition between the chapters we just reviewed, chapters 1 through 6, the historical record of Nehemiah rebuilding the wall, and a narrative, chapters 8 through 13, that centers on spiritual revival in the people of Jerusalem. And we'll begin that next week. So to put chapter 7 into context, this transition, let's begin with just a few verses from the end of chapter 6. This will kind of give you the undercurrents once again, of what's going on as we make our way into this transition. We'll begin with chapter 6, verse 15. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of Elul in 52 days. And it happened when all of our enemies heard about it and the nations around us saw these things that they were very disheartened in their own eyes. For they perceived that this work was done by our God. The wall was finished in record time. It's a great time of joy, accomplishment, and victory in Jerusalem. But a time of disheartenment for those who had resisted the effort of building the wall. Why? For they perceived that the wall was not completed by Nehemiah. Are the army of workers, the laborers that were working so hard, but by God himself? See, not only are the workers of the city aware of God's hand 
upon their work. But those in opposition to Nehemiah are heartbroken. They're devastated for the very same reason. They're not followers of God, mind you, but they see his providence and his presence upon his people. That would be a very scary thing to the opposition. In those days, verse 17, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah, and letters of Tobiah came back from them. For many in Judah were pledged to him. Many in Judah were pledged to Tobiah because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Ara. And his son, Jehoanan, had married the daughter of Meshulam, the son of Berchiah. Also, they reported Tobiah's good deeds before me, kind of rubbing it in, and reported my words to him. And Tobiah continues to send letters to frighten Nehemiah. Now, keep in mind, we're reading from Nehemiah's personal journal here. And what he's documenting for us are some really strange relationships that developed between the Jewish nobles in Judah and Tobiah, the ringleader of those opposed to rebuilding Jerusalem. Many, we're told, in Judah had pledged themselves to Tobiah because of these relationships. And one thing I hope you'll see in, the, in this situation, as the wall is now finished, man, when you're doing the Lord's work, the enemy is never done with you. He never quits. Pastor John said a few weeks ago, the dust never settles, and it doesn't. The methods may change, but the enemy is still poised to strike. See, back in chapter 2, when we first heard of resistance to Nehemiah building the wall. It came in the form of scoffing and questioning. Well, that didn't work. Then in chapter 4, we saw defiance through anger and rage, through mockery and threats. But the work continued at that point. In chapter 6, the harassment comes through lies and intimidation and discouragement. And now through these letters, and these unique alliances that are being established. See, the wall is done, but the enemy's not. He ultimately wants Nehemiah's efforts to fail, and he's going to stop at nothing to make that happen. And let me say this this morning. It's the same for you and I, guys. As we do the work the Lord has asked us to do, the enemy's always watching. He's always plotting always waiting for the opportune time to attack. I love this quote from motivational speaker and author Zig Ziglar. Zig once said, if you haven't met Satan face to face today, it's probably because you're running in the same direction that he is. <laughs> you're not opposing him. When you're engaged in the work of the Lord, opposition is just a given. It is. The enemy of our soul is always there, just waiting to attack us. Now, some may ask, why then would you even engage in the work? Why would any of us commit to fight the spiritual battle every day, walking around with a huge target on our backs? I think the disciple Peter said it best. As some disciples were leaving the cause of Christ, Jesus asked the 12, the disciples, do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter said this, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Now, I don't know if you've hit that part of your life yet, but it's amazing when that transition happens. One day you'll wake up and you'll realize, man, Jesus is really the only way. He is. Nehemiah and the workers had learned, and I hope you and I have kind of learned as we've read, studied, and completed the first section of Nehemiah. When the enemy attacks, when he attacks again, and when he's just so persistent, he continues to attack, we keep our eyes on the Lord. 
and the work that he's got for us. That's got to be our focus. Keep our eyes on Jesus. That's how Nehemiah and the workers endured as they rebuilt the wall. And that's how you and I will survive as we do God's work under the enemy's watchful eye. Then it was, verse 1, chapter 7, when the wall was built and I had hung the doors, when the gatekeepers, the singers, and the Levites had been appointed, that I gave charge of Jerusalem to my brother Hanani, and Hananiah, the leader of the citadel, for he was a faithful man and feared God more than many. So despite the scoffing and questioning, the lies and the intimidation and the discouragement that went along with that. Even in the face of Nehemiah's own people, the nobles of Judah falling in with Tobiah, the wall was finished. And as important as finishing the wall was, listen to this transitional perspective from Warren Wearsby. He said, a city is much more than walls, gates, and houses. A city is people. In the first half of this book, the people existed for the walls, but now the walls must exist for the people. It was time to organize the community so that the citizens could enjoy the quality of life that God wanted them to have. God had great things in store for Jerusalem, great things. For one day, his son would walk the city streets, teach in the temple, and die outside the city walls. Jerusalem was important. So as Nehemiah began the transition from the walls to worship, one of his first acts was to appoint godly leadership. First mention of the gatekeepers. Nehemiah knew that the strong, newly built gates were of little use if nobody was guarding them and nobody was controlling who entered and left the city. Somebody had to do that. Next, the singers and Levites were appointed. The singers and the Levites were there to lead the people in worship. See, the walls were not rebuilt so the people of Jerusalem could look around and say, man, we've got some beautiful walls in this city. The walls were rebuilt so the people could safely worship God with greater glory and freedom. That was the plan. And as a group, that responsibility lied firmly on the shoulders of the singers and the Levites. And listen, they start worshiping because of the victory that's occurred with the wall. Listen to what Bible commentator David Guzik said about praising God in life's victories. I love this. Every victory in our life should take us deeper into praise. If we're not praising God more and more deeply with each passing year, are we really having much victory? Maybe we're making it through tough times, but coming out more bitter and sour than ever. That is not God's victory. His victory leads to a sweeter spirit and a deeper praise. So let me ask you a question this morning. How does that apply to your life and to my life today? Do we find ourselves praising God more deeply with each passing victory? Or do we find that we're just kind of making it through those challenges? See, God's plan for his people as we fight through each battle and endure difficult times, is always higher praise and deeper worship. That's what he's calling us into. As we experience victories in our life, big and small, we need to worship the Lord for what he has done. That's what leads to a sweeter spirit personally and higher praise. Then Nehemiah gave the responsibility of governing Judah to two trusted men, Hanani and Hananiah. So who were these two guys? And what were their qualifications for leadership? Well, you may remember Hanani from chapter 1. He's Nehemiah's brother. 
And he's one of a group of guys that kind of brought the sad news to him about Jerusalem. He had a deep concern for Jerusalem and was a prime initiator in everything else that followed. And then Hananiah, who was described as a faithful man, a man who feared God more than many, qualities that God needs in a man or woman to use them greatly. I believe that. Hananiah was faithful to God and fearful of God. He was also the man in charge of the citadel, a fortress in the temple area. So he had some experience in defending the wall in a particularly vulnerable area. These two men would tag team the administration and security of Jerusalem as Nehemiah moved on to what was next for him. And it's here through this change in leadership that you really see Nehemiah's character. See, he wasn't rebuilding the wall for political glory. Man, if he was, he would have stayed there. He had done the work he was called to do, and now he could let it go. God would still use him in Jerusalem, but Nehemiah knew it wasn't his place to stay in authority. And that brings us to verse 3, if you'll look with me. And I said to them, Nehemiah speaking to these two men, Do not let the gates of Jerusalem be opened until the sun is hot. And while they stand guard, let them shut and bar the doors, and appoint guards from among the inhabitants of Jerusalem, one at his own watch station and another in front of his own house. In the midst of passing the torch, Nehemiah gave specific instructions concerning the opening and the closing of the gates of the city. He said, open them late and close them early. Don't open the gates in the dark. And then from the people, he said, place guards around the walls of the city. Let the people who have built the wall, sacrificed for the wall, invested in the wall, now protect the wall. And you've got to remember through all of this, the opposition to rebuild and restore Jerusalem hadn't gone away. They just developed different strategies over time. Very wise, very skillful. The verbal conflict was still loud and clear, and the opposition remained very effective very aggressive. So Nehemiah passes on wise counsel to keep the city safe and ready for any kind of attack. And I hope you'll hear this message from really, I believe, the church today, this warning passed down from Nehemiah's hand to you and I. If we as God's people don't protect what's been accomplished in us and through us by the hand of God, the enemy will gladly come in and tear it down. He will. And we must always be faithful to stand and stay on guard around our city and in front of our own house. We're the ones guarding the city. So Nehemiah, all of a sudden, it it takes us to a place where he's looking over the city of Jerusalem. And in verse 4, he tells us what he saw. Now the city was large and spacious, but the people in it were few, and the houses were not rebuilt. Then my God put it into my heart to gather the nobles, the rulers, and the people, that they might be registered by genealogy. And I found a registry of the genealogy of those who had come up in the first return. After viewing Jerusalem, God put it in Nehemiah's heart to grow and prosper the city, not in terms of the wall this time, but in terms of the people. The walls and the gates were not the goal. A safe place for the people to live, serve, and worship the Lord. That was the goal. And just like Nehemiah's reconnaissance mission of the city walls before he started the building. 
He took steps necessary to know the people that he was starting with. Hey, who's, who's really out there is what was happening here. And God provided this incredible tool to do that. He puts in Nehemiah's hands the genealogy of those who had come up with Zerubbabel. So who were these people? Well, look with me in verse 6. These are the people in the province who came back from the captivity of who had been carried away, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away and who returned to Jerusalem and Judah, everyone to his own city. See, as the city of Jerusalem was taken by Babylon, that's recorded for us back in 2 Kings. It tells us there all Jerusalem was taken into captivity by King Nebuchadnezzar. Now later, Persia conquered Babylon, and they began to release the Jewish captives to return to their homeland. And the Jews were released not all at once, but kind of in waves. And these people that we're talking about here came back in an early wave. Now, here's the thing. 99% of the remainder of chapter 7 is the genealogy itself. Have you read through it? <laughs> well, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking I've studied long and hard and I'm going to read through it. And I hate to disappoint you, but I am. We're not going to do that this morning. But here's what I am going to do as we finish out the chapter and kind of conclude our time together in God's Word today. I'm going to give you three observations that I hope you'll take away with you from Nehemiah chapter 7. Just three. So jot them down as we go along. Make notes. And the first is this. People are important to God. Man, look at the names in this genealogy. Each one mentioned by name. And each one is important, Warren Wiersbe says, because of the connection they represent from their past defeats to their hopes of the future. These Jews were living links that connected the historic past with the prophetic future and made it possible for Jesus to come into the world. That's important. The list includes real people, like the original leaders of Jerusalem, Jewish laymen, priests, Levites, singers and gatekeepers, temple servants, descendants of the servants of Solomon, even some people who had kind of questionable ancestry. They were listed there too. God took, to, took a group of prisoners of war. He calls them back to their homeland now and used them to rebuild their city amid great opposition and constant threats. And then he publishes their names in his word. Not only here in Nehemiah, but also in the preceding book of Ezra. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty important to me. I don't have my name listed two times in God's Word. These guys do. So what's this all have to do with us? Well, to me, it's a great reminder that God is still calling and connecting His people today. He's calling us out of captivity from the sins of our past, and He's connecting us together in unity to do the work that He's called us to do, both now and and in the future. But listen, the enemy still lingers, and he's so very creative. He's persistent. He's still out there. He's attacking even now. And you and I, church, we're the targets. We're the enemy's targets. But here's the thing. Just as in Nehemiah's day, with God's help and strength, the righteous can rebuild what's been torn down and start all over again. 
See, it's not so much in the falling down, but in the getting back up. Whatever's been destroyed by the enemy in your life, God can do a Jerusalem-sized work there. Through the power of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ, and His Holy Spirit, you and I can fight the good fight and be victors in the war against evil. We can count on Jesus to rebuild and restore whatever the enemy has ruined. Second observation, number two if you're taking notes. Quality leadership is imperative. As the transition is taking place from the wall to worship, from the project to the people, Nehemiah's first course of action is to appoint leadership. And the standard? Faithfulness to God and a fear of God. Faithfulness to God and a fear of God. And please hear me out. This doesn't mean that giftings and abilities aren't important in leadership. But it clearly tells us, it clearly indicates to us that God is more concerned about an individual's character than his qualifications. It's been said, maybe you've heard this, many folks who aren't all that gifted can still be greatly used of God if they are faithful and fear God. On the other hand, many terribly gifted people may always be frustrated in serving God if they're not faithful and God-fearing. See, the important thing is that we're faithful and that we fear God. Now, when you're faithful to the Lord, it means that you're loyal, that you're unwavering and reliable regardless of any circumstances that are coming upon you. Apart from God, we wouldn't even know what faithfulness is because faithfulness comes from Him. A good description of fearing God is found in Hebrews 12, 28 and 29. You might just jot that down somewhere. It says there, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, Let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. This reverence and awe are exactly what the fear of God means to those who are following Christ Jesus. They're the motivating factors for us truly to surrender to our Creator and our King. So how are we applying the fear of God and faithfulness to our lives today? Are we seeking to develop these characteristics and traits in our life? They're consistently used in the Bible to qualify people for leadership. So I believe you and I can be the kind of leader God desires by being faithful and reliable in our commitment to Him and fearing him as we're motivated by reverence and awe. And the final most important lesson is this. This is number three for your outline. Each one of us needs to be absolutely sure of our own spiritual genealogy. Personal application for you. We need to know without the shadow of a doubt that we're connected to God through our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's the only way we can be connected. Earlier today in the Old Testament, we saw idolatry and disobedience of the Jewish people separated them from God. It destroyed their city and left them in captivity in Babylon. But God had a plan. In Nehemiah, we see the Jews coming back to Jerusalem. They're rebuilding the wall of that city and then experiencing restoration and revival with God through the word and worship. That's what's happening. Likewise, the Bible says that we've all sinned. You and I have, each and every one of us. 
we've missed the mark or fallen short in God's plan in some way, and we've caused this unbridgeable gap in our relationship. And as a result, we've been taken captive by the law of sin and death. That's where we stand without Jesus. But Jesus, what does Jesus do? Thank you. He rebuilds and he restores. That's what Jesus does. He rebuilds and restores. So through his great sacrifice, his death, burial, and resurrection, Jesus overcame the power of sin and death. He rebuilt our connection with God and restored the intimacy that we once experienced with him through a relationship that's based in love and obedience. And let me say this in closing as I invite the the worship band back to the stage. If you're here today and you find yourself somehow separated from God, he's waiting on you.